All right, so I'm here today with Ms. Beth Harper. She is the National Superintendent for the Environmental Natural Resources, CDE. Very excited to have her with us. She is going to provide us with some very important background on how to use the Scantron for the ENR CD. So Ms. Harper, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. Um, so for those of you who are going to be watching this video, this is going to be a, a Scantron that's similar to what we've used. It's judging card based. So just like we always do, obviously team number, code, last name, first name, just like we always do. Then you're going to see this water quality box. We've never done an event with water quality on it. And so Ms. Harper, what exactly are we looking at here? Okay, so we've left it as general as possible so that we don't have to alter the scorecard every year. So as you see, we don't name the tests that we are asking the students to do. When they come up to the water test station, they will have a specific tests outlined that they'll be doing. So where it says water samples, if we have more than one water sample, we'll have that it's, it's very specific and very well laid out. If you are testing from water sample one, you will bubble in a one there. Um, if you're testing from water sample two, it'll be very well indicated on the water sample that you'll be testing. Most of the time it's not necessary. Um, we usually only have one body of water that we're taking the water from and it's pretty consistent throughout. Um, pH, we do ask the students to write a number down and bubble it in um, with whatever equipment we're asking them to test the pH with. So it may be as simple as litmus paper. It may be a reagent indicator. Whatever their answer is, they will bubble it in the pH. Those are the two pH and temperature are two of the standards we always ask students. Um, we vary whether it's going to be degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit. And again, sometimes it's whatever equipment is available. If we have more Fahrenheit thermometers, then it's Fahrenheit. If we have more centigrade thermometers, it's centigrade. Um, but we just make it clear to the student um, via, you know, big instruction boards as they approach. And we make sure that every group that comes to that station gets the same instructions throughout the entire event in order to have things as even as possible. It has to be. Um, then we come to the test three, four, five, and six. Those will be the variables. Uh, you may be testing for nitrates this year. You may be testing for nitrites. You may be testing for um, dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen is one that is a little tricky because it takes so long when you're using a reagent type test. Um, but it, it is possible. Um, and again, whatever you're testing for, you'll be very specific. So saying test number three will be nitrites. Um, test number four will be dissolved oxygen. And they will have the time to perform the test and record the results. And again, be very, cognizant of how long these tests take for students to run with whatever testing equipment you're using. Um, we provide all that testing equipment and the other essential part, and this is pretty much with all the practicums, is very, very specific instructions. So in another words, I have students that come to nationals at times that have never tested water and they can successfully test a water sample right then and there, if they know how to read and follow directions. It's like a cooking instruction. Step one, get a water sample, get five milliliters, and there will be indications of how to measure the five milliliters. Put two drops of reagent number one into your test tube, swirl. You know, so it, it has to be very, very specific. I have some very good examples of those, um, instructions, but most companies that will sell you a test kit or will sell you the testing reagents will give you the specific instructions. So it comes ready made for you. We just print them up and laminate them so each student can have their own instruction sheet. Limiting factors, those are really questions and they're multiple choice questions. Um, in another words, we ask them specific things that maybe today you're testing for pH and we're going to ask you a pH question. 
not necessarily using your findings, but in general. And there are usually 10 of those. Sometimes, you know, depending on the points breakdown, there we we have the ability to use more or less questions to make sure that our points break down, it works out. Okay, I think that's pretty well covers water. And for those of you who will be participating this year, our plan is to have the water testing supplies on site for you already. Uh, we'll go back to the website page here in a minute and I'll show you where to find resources that Nichols has recommended that you purchase for practice at school, but we are intending to provide you with those resources on site so everyone has access to the same ones. Um, the other component we'll have this year, Ms. Harper is going to be the written exam. This is pretty straightforward. Um, very straightforward. Very it's much like multiple we, choice test. Yeah, yeah, just like we do with all of our other CDEs, this will be based on the past five years of national exams. They're currently posted on the National FFA website. I'm also going to make sure to pull them and put them on our website so you can start practicing that now. Just pull those last five years. It will be from 2015 through 2019, because there was no exam in 2020 and the 2021 exams are not yet posted. So 2015 through 2019 is what we'll be using. Yes, excellent. And most of the resources that the exam questions come from, I shouldn't say most, all of them are listed on the national website. So for study purposes, um, generally you can look at those resources. Um, it's, it's most everything is covered in very specific sections. When you think of environmental impacts with air, water, soil, um, real specific areas, and we try to keep those questions um, th that will cover all those areas pretty evenly. Okay, we'll come back to GPS in just a second. The okay. other one that's pretty straightforward that most of you are accustomed with is identification. This is gonna be the same sort of practicum that we do for vet science and floriculture and nursery and anything else that's got an ID component. We will give you a competition card that's gonna have the potential uh, IDs listed with the corresponding number. The student will just have to identify what it is and bubble the number in. Um, again, that is already posted to the website. It's in the rules. You can have students start practicing with that. You can find images of all that online um, as you're practicing at school. So that's another one that's pretty straightforward. Ms. Harper, the one we've had the most questions about has been the GPS practicum. So can okay. you explain to us what are we looking at on this particular section? When you look at the GPS, you are going to have possibly several different tests and your tests will be numbered. Um, you will be asked when you come to the GPS station, you will be asked specific, and I, I talked um, specifically about the examples that are on the national um, site. And I think a particularly good one is the one we pulled up. Um, so you will have several, there will be several different tracks that the students will go through. And I am gonna put you in touch with our GPS experts so he can help facilitate how exactly to set up these different tracks. Um, but you will be asked, or the student will be asked specifically um, at this station, what is the latitude and the longitude of this station and record it in question number two. Again, very specific. You can almost expect students that have never worked with the GPS very much to be able to complete this section, maybe not flawlessly, but at least they won't be totally lost because everything is extremely specific. You may be asked to measure um, the area of a specific rectangle or a specific shape in the field. And the student will take their GPS and measure the feet and then come back and we'll provide them a formula and we'll show them exactly what to do on the instructions that are at that station, you know, nothing ahead of time. Um, and they'll be asked to calculate that area of the shape of the rectangle. Um, other times they may be asked um, to follow some coordinates and pick out where they are and it may be um, a stake with a letter C on it, or it may be, you know, um, a, a number. But the, the point is they have to go out and follow their GPS 
and then mark where they are. And again, the four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten will be very specific about what they need to be following. Uh, whether it's, you know, this is this is number five, bubble it in for number five. Again, the, the key to this is very clear, specific instructions. And uh, our past GPS um, questions um, and some of the examples are on the national website. They're also asked, I believe 10, and again, we leave that pretty flexible, um, 10, 12, 15 different multiple choice questions, specifically just about um, GPS, what do they know about it? You know, what does it stand for? Um, how is it used? Um, and, and this is, you know, sometimes it's, it's some technical things that they never thought about needing to study. I am going to put you in touch though, with my GPS expert so that he can help you guys set up different courses. Um, no need to reinvent the wheel if we've already got it kind of figured out. And he's done this many times, um, in his home state as well as for national. And uh, he's uh, very, very good at it. So and, when I'm ahead. looking at this GPS section where it's saying test number one through nine, is a student only gonna do one of these nine? It depends what he's using that test number for. But yes, normally it would only be you know, one test. Um, his multiple choices are going to be the answers to that test. Mm -hmm. The GPS one, two, three, four, you know, the four, five, six, seven, those are the specific things they'll be doing in their course. And so like this makes sense to me, you know, latitude, longitude, when I get yes. down to four through 10, what do these numbers represent? The, they'll just be the specific question or the specific task he's asked you to do. So if it's a task number four, and it, it specifically says, and that's where it follows along. If you look at this, while you look at the examples on the national website, it'll make a little more sense because it'll say in section number two, I want you to look up the longitude and latitude for this. Okay. Okay. The other ones obviously are not gonna ask you for a longitude and latitude because they're not long enough but they're gonna ask you for specific things that will fall into the category of, you know, one through nine, um, you know, possibly a hundred, but he's gonna ask you a number. Um, okay. And it may be that specific spot he's looking for. Again, leaving it pretty open in general to be able to kind of manipulate the, the, the type of event he's going to put on you know, and, and, and honestly, GPS can't change that much. Right. Perfect. Do you have any other thoughts you want to leave our teachers as they practice with the scorecard? Obviously, they need to reference national examples. Right. And yeah. With ID, some of the things I see are the silliest mistakes are students not understanding how to fill in the ID card. Um, you know, bubbling the three numbers that pertain that exactly represent that specimen that they're looking at. Um, we try to use as many um, whole specimens and as possible and less photographs as possible. Um, so that's a good way to practice. If you can get a hold of as many uh, from your wildlife people or from NRCS usually has a pretty good connection um, on getting some specimens and, you know, most universities, but, uh, making sure they understand writing the number and making sure they correspond to bubbles. I mean, it's heartbreaking to see students, um, not understand how to bubble it in. Yeah. It's mechanics. And our nickel staff is going to try to provide as many real life specimens as perfect. They try to minimize the number of photographs, just like we do with our other events. Excellent. It sounds like you guys will be able to put on a decent um, mirror of what we do at national. Yeah. Um, you know, we have the, you guys are going to rotate your practicums. So again, data interpretation, waste management, those are, you know, always a little iffy because the idea of a practicum is we want it as hands-on as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and those really aren't 
as hands-on as we'd like them to be. Um, but we provide the students with as much resources that they have to use, that they would use anywhere, you know, whether it's map interpretation or fact sheet interpretations and uh, answer questions that pertain to. Sometimes we've got dioramas that they have to look at and identify things. But those, like I said, those are always the little gray areas. We would like it to be a little more hands-on, but with those two areas, which we feel are kind of important in environmental and natural resources are, are more difficult to actually have them getting their hands dirty and doing things. So we're gonna have further webinars for you, especially one on GPS in the coming weeks. So be on the lookout for that. But for now, we wanna thank Ms. Harper for joining us and getting us through the scorecard. So thank you, Ms. Harper, we appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. I'd like to be more help and I will serve as a reference and a resource anytime you need it for any of the teachers or um, for you just to feed back through them to them. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. You're welcome.